Sydney Point family, we've actually moved into a new theme this month, and we're, we're talking about moving into the future. Uh, and to do that, I actually want to have a macro look, a bird's eye view of the gospel. Uh, in the next 29 minutes, we're going to go all the way from Genesis through to the book of Revelation. No S, Pastor Chris. Book of Revelation. There's only one revelation, and that's Jesus Christ. I wasn't throwing shade there, I was just, <laughs> if I see tonight, I like this crowd. But we're, we're gonna have a bird's eye view because I believe the way you view the, the gospel in your life, where you position yourself in relation to the gospel in your life, will determine a great deal of how you move into the future. How you view the gospel and how it plays in your life and the power of the gospel in your life will determine a lot of how you move into the future, not only just in your everyday to day, but in your marriage in your family, in your career, in your study, in your life, in your health, in every single facet of the way in which you go about life, how you view the gospel, it's going to determine the quality of how you move into the future. To do this, I want to start in the Gospel of John in the 11th chapter and the 35th verse. I've been rehearsing this all week, so hopefully I can get this verse right. I've tried to memorize it. Here we go. Jesus wept. Thank you. I even learnt it in the Amplified Version. Jesus wept. I love this verse because even though it is the shortest verse in the Bible, it doesn't take much memorising. It actually has massive theological implications, not only to the humanity of Jesus, but also to his deity. Because this verse actually takes place in the midst of the story of Lazarus, his friend, he died. And Jesus was on the way to get Lazarus and to actually raise him from the dead. He knew that actually Lazarus was, was going to live again. But even though he knew Lazarus would live again, even though he knew the story would end out well, the tragedy, the death and the suffering that Lazarus was momentarily experiencing did two things to Jesus. It moved him to tears and it moved him to action. Right here, I think we get a great glimpse into the heart of God, into the gospel. That while you're in the midst of your suffering, while in, you're in the midst of your tragedy, while your circumstance is bringing death to you, it does two things to God. It moves him to tears and it moves him to action. This, of course, was not actually the first time that God cried. The first time I believe God cried is way back here in the Garden of Eden. This is the Garden of Eden. You might need to slightly tilt your head, squint your eyes a little bit, but this is the Garden of Eden. And this here is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, you have gotta understand the Garden of Eden was designed for humanity. It's the natural environment of humanity. In the Garden of Eden, it was the perfect presence of God, His perfect provision, His rest, His protection. God was there with Adam. Humanity and deity dwelt together, lived together, dreamed together, and they were a family. This is where the natural habitat of humanity is. That's why if, if you're not living in the presence of God and in His provision and all that He has for you, then it will feel like something's missing. Why? Because you're not in your naturally designed environment. And so Adam there, the other thing I'd say, he was placed there by grace. He didn't earn his way into the garden. He didn't have to like stay out of the garden and recite the Ten Commandments three times before he was allowed access. He didn't have to live five years in the wilderness to prove his faithfulness to enter into the garden. No, he was placed there and designed to live there through God's grace, a free gift for him to live in the perfect presence and paradise of God. Yet there was one thing in all of God's provision. God said, don't touch it. You can have dominion. You have my authority. Adam was placed there as a king of the world. But he said, one thing is not yours, and that's the knowledge of good and evil. God always wants to be the source of the knowledge of good and evil in your world. And part of the perfected, created order of the universe is when we place God as the authority of what is good 
and what is evil. And when Adam ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, one, I don't blame him too much because his wife gave it to him. And whenever my wife gives me food, I don't question it. I'm like, sweet food, let's eat. So on the one hand, I don't blame Adam, but on the other hand, you've got to understand it wasn't simply just a moral fall. It wasn't simply just an act of sin. It was a reordering of the perfected harmony in which God created the universe. They took God out of His rightful place and put Himself in that morally autonomous place. The result was a self-legislating humanity that was morally autonomous. The logical progression of this is moral relativism and individually designed ethics. We are doing the same thing today in a thousand different ways. Humanity has not changed. We're taking God's perfect created harmony, His life, His perfection and His truth and whenever we do that and destroy it and rearrange it, the result is always death, deception and destruction. We were never meant to taste this fruit. We talk of liberty and freedom in ways that enslave us to our own brokenness and fragility. We talk of beauty, love and music and we wanna talk about goodness and enjoy truth and hope, yet we want these things to exist outside the concept of moral absolutes and even the reality of evil. We've become victims at the hands of ourselves as we deny the cause of suffering yet fight for our God-given right to cause it. It is a fruit that we were never meant to taste. We wanted His liberty without His way. We wanted His hope without His truth. And we wanted His life, but not His existence. I love how Ravi Zacharias puts it. He said, we want God's goodness, but not His definition of good. And whenever you do that, whenever we do that to God, and like it was with Adam, the result is death. Now let me explain death to you. Death doesn't mean the cessation of life. You're gonna live on somewhere. As a matter of fact, even when we talk about death right now, it would be just a separating of your spirit from your body, not the cessation of life. You're gonna live on. And the same was for Adam. He lived on, but he experienced physical death. He experienced eternal death and he experienced spiritual death. What is death? Separation. And this is where we hear the first cry of God in Genesis chapter three. He comes into the garden and he says, Adam, where are you? Now, I've got four kids and thank you. I think my wife deserves more credit, but I'll I'll take that little bit of praise right there. When you take four kids to the shops, especially big shops like Big W or Woolworths or something like that, it is a constant counting exercise. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Every now and then though, it goes one, two, three. And you're like, Jack, where are you? Elsie, where are you? And you start looking for them. And the very first thought that comes across your mind as a father is not the welfare of the child. It's quick, find them before my wife finds out. (laughs) I was standing in Woolworths one day just looking at some ingredients and and Elsie, my eldest, was standing there and then, uh, and then all of a sudden I was uh, comparing ingredients and I look up and Elsie's gone. Like she's nowhere in the whole aisle, like nowhere to be seen at all. And my very first thought was, I've missed the rapture. <laughs> I've been left behind. And then I thought, no, wait, I need to find her before Bonnie finds out. And so I start looking for her. She's not on this aisle. She's not on the aisle next to me. She's not on that aisle. I start frantically looking around and as I'm at the bottom of an aisle, I see in the distance a good, kind, caring lady leading her by the hand to the front counter. This is code red. Because if that good, kind lady gets to the counter, the only thing that's gonna be communicated across that microphone is, Bonnie, Joshua has lost your child. Bonnie, Joshua has lost your child in aisle six. I do not want that announcement to go out. One day, while we're confessing sins, I mean, we're in church, I was at soccer training with my four-year-old, Jack, who played four. Now, soccer when they're four is a fairly loose term. (laughs) It's not so much of a game. They kind of turn up and do like individually designed skill sort of sets and they rotate and they they change sets and 
And, and you know, it's extremely riveting stuff, and I'm sure all of you would have paid attention the entire time, but I may have got my phone out and started checking social media to see what was, you know, happening in between these skill sets. And, and I look up and I can't see Jack. He's gone. Now, that's not at first anything strange because Jack, if you know my son, he's kind of just, you know, organises his own world. And if it's not kind of suiting him, he'll just take initiative and go change us. He might like just go to the next skill set that he wants to do. But I look at the next skill set. He's not there either. Uh, I look at the next one. He's not there. And I start now starting to get a little bit bit worried. I start standing up and I'm looking for him. Now, they're all dressed the same and it's not just one soccer team. It's like this, this like 44-year-olds, not, not 44-year-olds, that'd be weird, 44-year-olds playing soccer and like as soon as you put like a jersey and some socks on a four-year-old, you can't see any skin. It's just you can just see a big haze of orange, a bit hard to see where your son is. I'm looking, I'm pacing up and down. I cannot see him. I start going out to the field. I still can't see him. It's now two to three minutes, although if Bonnie asks, one to two minutes. And I'm starting to walk to the car park. I'm starting to really actually get quite panicked because I have been separated from my son. I can't see him anywhere. And as two minutes turns into three minutes, turns into four minutes, I am like this close to starting to yell at the top of my lungs. Jack, where are you? And just as I'm about to yell at the top of my lungs, I hear this cry coming from the toilet. And luckily and fortunately, what had happened is Jack just needed to go to the toilet. So he went in and it's a push door to get in. So he was able to get in fine, but it was a pull door to get out and it was too heavy for him. So we got stuck in there for only, only a few moments. <laughs> and so he couldn't get out. So I found my son. But, it, but if you just back up just, just a, a couple of moments before I found him, I, I, I want you to understand. It, when I was about to say, Jack, where are you? It wasn't going to be a quiet yell. I had been separated from my son. I was about to yell, Jack, where are you? That there? I believe that's the context of what we read, the first cry of God. It's the cry of a father who's been separated from his son. God isn't turning up into the Garden of Eden and he's not saying, Adam, Adam, where are you? as if it's some sort of cosmic hide and seek. I mean, the guy's omniscient. He knew where Adam was. It was the cry of a father. Adam, where are you? We were so close. We were intimately joined together. Our spirits were intertwined with one another. Our lives were together. Our hopes and our dreams were shared. We were family. We were father and son. I turned to you and you were no longer there. You had gone. I'd felt you. I knew what your heartbeat felt like, but you're no longer there. You've been separated from me. Your life has been separated from me. Your existence has been separated from me. Adam, where are you? That... It's the first cry of God, and it comes from the Father. And it echoes out of the Garden of Eden all the way through time, even into our temporary context where the cry of the Father is still to those who don't know Him. Where are you? I'm looking for you. I want you in my presence. See, in our human understanding, especially if we got any sort of religious upbringing, it is fairly conventional and normalized to think that actually the goal of humanity is to reach up and to attain some sort of notionality that we are worthy to be in God's presence. The scandal of the gospel, and it's completely the other way around, that God desires to be in your presence. He has many names. But I believe that actually his favorite name is Emmanuel. The one that he loves to go with is God with us. And we see it right here in the Garden of Eden. The fruit of this tree is something that humanity was never meant to taste. And it was the first time that shame entered into the body. They started making fig leaves for themselves. It was the first time that Adam tasted loneliness. It was the first time humanity tasted sickness and disease. It was the first time humanity ever tasted suffering. There was another tree in that garden. It was the tree of life. And God said, I don't want you to eat of the tree of life in this current state. 
I'm going to need to fix this before you eat of that tree again. And so he takes that tree out of the Garden of Eden and he places it all the way here in heaven. This is the tree of life. It's like a clapper. The tree of life also has fruit that we can taste. The first fruit that we know of the tree of life is obviously it's eternal. It will give you eternal life. What came through the first tree was death, but what comes through the tree of life is actually eternal life. But there's also another fruit that we know of and that it's actually righteousness, that when we eat of the tree of life, that actually, we actually inherit righteousness. In Revelation chapter two, verse seven, Jesus speaking to the churches, he says, to him who has ears, let him hear. What the Spirit is saying to the churches, if those who overcome and victor or victorious, and we are, if you're in Christ Jesus, you're an overcomer and you are victorious, I will grant you the ability to eat of the tree of life, to eat and be called righteous again. But not only that, the tree of life also has fruit of hope and goodness and joy, abundant joy, happiness. Not only that, the leaves of the tree of life are actually used to heal the nations. It is a tree that brings wholeness and healing and restoration. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil brought death and destruction and deception, yet the tree of life, it brings healing and wholeness and restoration. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil separated us from God, but there is a cry from Holy Spirit saying, I am gonna grant you to eat of this tree. There's also another cry that comes from Holy Spirit. We see it in Galatians chapter four, verse six. It says, to him who are being called the children of God, Abba Father, or sorry, the Holy Spirit is in our, in, our, in our spirit and it's crying out within us and beckoning us to call God Father again. Remember this part? This is where humanity and deity were separate, where a father lost his son while in the tree of life. We discover that actually Holy Spirit in Galatians 4 verse 6 invites us to call God Father again. It's the complete reversal. Romans 8 has another way of putting it in verses 14 to 17. And we'll read this in the message version. It says this, God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant. Greeting God with a child like, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. That's the cry of Holy Spirit that is coming up from the inside of us, inviting you to say, look, I know that there has been a lot of separation and suffering that's come through the first tree, but because you now are inheritors of abundant life, you're able to call God Papa and you're able to go on an amazing adventure with Him. You know what I love about this? We often see the gospel like this. We're in death and sin and separation. And if we turn to Jesus, then one day, someday, in the far distant future, our lives will be a okay That's not what the gospel is. The gospel is that, hey, death and separation and suffering came through what the first Adam did. But actually, the, the tree of life, what Christ has achieved, the reunification with the Father means that every single bit of Christ's salvation and saving grace infiltrates down out of heaven into our existence now and totally revolutionises the way that you live right now. That you've been called the children of God right now. That you've been called on an epic adventure right now. That you've been invited to experience the inheritance of God right now. That's why Jesus invited us. He said, when you pray, pray like this. Whatever is in heaven, let it be here on earth. Your kingdom come and your will be done. So what does that mean? It means this, our prayer life needs to be shaped by what we know of heaven and not what we see on earth. I'm not denying the reality that there is sin and sickness and suffering in the world and it may even be in the life of a believer still. Granted, let's not ignore that. And some of us even in this room have had some really grave tragedies that we've had to deal with as children of God. Yet it doesn't negate the fact that Holy Spirit beckons us and Jesus invites us and instructs us to make sure that the way in which we walk out our faith is more influenced by what we know of heaven than what we see around us in our everyday today. That yeah, there's a reality to our life here on earth, but there is a truth from heaven that cascades down and it should infiltrate our everyday. 
How is this possible though? How is it possible that we can actually live in this tension of the fact that we live in a broken, fallen world, yet we are called to be children of God, inheritors of the promise, and, and everything that God has called us to be? Well, that's because there's a third tree. There's a third tree that actually comes into the story at the midpoint. And where we position ourselves on this storyline will be a result of this third tree, and that is the cross of Calvary. The cross of Calvary is a tree that Jesus hung on. And in Galatians 3, we read that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The reason this tree comes into the story is for this reason. There is a cry from Jesus as well. There's a cry from the Father that says, Adam, where are you? Humanity, where are you? I want to hold you in my family again and live in my presence. I wanna be in your presence is the cry of the Father. There's a cry from Holy Spirit saying that, hey, you have been given an awesome inheritance. And even the, the writer of John says, behold, what manner of love is this that we would be called children of God? But the reason we can get from there to here is because of this, the third tree and the cry from Jesus. The cry from Jesus is this, as He hung on that cross, taking the whole curse for us, taking all our sickness, taking all our our sin and our disease and our brokenness. He hurled out a cry, which still impacts us today. And He says this, He says, It is finished. It's finished. It's over. It's done. Anything that came through that first tree, it's done. It's done away with. It's finished so that we can focus on everything that God has for us. And where you view yourself in this story will impact how you move into the future. Let me give you some really practical examples of that. Isaiah 53 was written before the cross. And so it says that by His stripes, speaking to the cross, we are healed. But you get over into 1 Peter 2.24, which was written after the cross, looking back at the cross, it says by His stripes, we were healed, past tense. So how you move into the future with your healing will be determined where you view yourself on this gospel story. Am I trying to attain the healing of God? Am I trying to earn the healing of God? Am I begging for the healing of God? Or am I just actually standing in the inheritance that I've been given, that I've been beckoned to by Holy Spirit? A healing is mine. The first time we see the concept of rest, which is, if I could sum up rest, it's the perfect provision, protection and presence of God. The first time we see that is in the Garden of Eden. That's where we're first introduced to that topic. And we actually see the Israelites trying to attain rest by entering into the promised land, but they can't and they fail because of lack of, lack of obedience and a lack of faith. So God had to come up with a new way of attaining the rest that He designed humanity to live in. And so before the cross, Israelites were not able to enter into God's rest, but we get over into Hebrews 4 and it says we, the church, those who believe in Christ Jesus have entered His rest. We've already done it. We've entered into the rest of God. We've entered into His presence. We've entered into His perfect provision. We've entered into His protection. That's our reality. That's how we live. But if we are positioning ourselves down here and not attaining the great and precious promises that have already been delivered to us, then we may not be able to move into the future with the full Fruition of everything that has been achieved on this third tree. Abraham, he was in the Old Testament. God said to him, I'm gonna bless you. I'm gonna bless you so bad, it's gonna make your head spin. Matter of fact, the blessing from you is gonna overflow out of your life into every single generation and every single tribe and nation on earth is really gonna get blessed through you. And then in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, Abraham died not actually achieving the promise. That was before the cross. Uh, We get after the cross. And in Galatians 3.29, it says that if you are in Christ, then you are actually the seed of Christ and you are blessed and, and, and actually have received the blessing of Abraham. Everything that was promised to Abraham has actually come through you because of Christ Jesus, but we need to position ourselves here, not down there. So what does this look like? So what? It's a nice environment to talk about it tonight, but at work tomorrow, what does that mean? School tomorrow, what does that mean? Well, let me ask you some questions. 
if you knew you stood in full victory, in the full promise of God, the presence of God, the protection of God as one of His children, what dreams would you let come alive in your heart again? And Monday morning when you wake up and we're not in a great worship environment, the presence of God, we're in a faith community, and you're by yourself. If you positioned yourself here, this aspect of the gospel moving into the future, what would your prayer life sound like now? Would you be positioning yourself down here asking that God bless you or will you have a prayer life that says, I walk in the full authority of Jesus Christ and the power of Holy Spirit and I command heaven come into my situation right now. It's how you position yourself. What would your worship sound like? if you knew that anything that came through Adam has been destroyed by Jesus Christ. I know this is an epic tale and you know what, it's taken us a while to get here, but I actually could have done it with one verse. So it's about that. <laughs> could have saved us all some time. We could be at Nando's right now. It's Romans 5.17. It's my favourite verse in the Bible. And it sums it up like this. It tells the story of the three trees in one verse. It says, for if by one man's offence, death reigned through the one. Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in the one, Jesus Christ. For if by one man's offence, death reigned, much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness are gonna reign in the one, Jesus Christ. It's the Gospel of much more. It's the Gospel of much more healing. Let me put it to you this way. Whatever sickness came through Adam, much more healing came through the One, Jesus Christ. Whatever death came through Adam, much more life came through the One, Jesus Christ. Whatever brokenness came through Adam, much more restoration comes through the One, Jesus Christ. Whatever deception, whatever suffering, whatever disease, whatever plagues you, whatever has put you in slavery, much more freedom, much more liberty, much more grace, much more love has come through the One, Jesus Christ. And if you're going to live and move into the future with a much more gospel, I want